All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer and uh, we can continue with that session. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much once again for giving us this beautiful day, this beautiful opportunity to come together, to learn from your word. To, we pray, God, that everything that we learn will minister to our hearts. It will be deeply rooted and grounded in our spirit of God, that we will apply it in our lives. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity in order to just uh, build your kingdom here on earth, God. We thank you, God. We submit this day sessions into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. Uh, so last class, uh, let me just uh, present the notes. Okay. Last class we did up to chapter 21, right? We talked about uh, counseling, uh, various aspects of uh, developing counseling skills. Uh, and it's very important to understand that uh, we are all a work in progress, right? We can never say that, okay, I know how to counsel everybody. Um, that's where the wisdom of God comes in. So even as we learn, we develop skills, we ask God for his wisdom, right? And then we also uh, use these practical uh, tips that we learned in chapter 21. Okay, let's get into chapter 22. Uh, ch chapter 22, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, the cell group leaders' values and disciplines. Uh, we looked at it a little bit of this in uh, section one, where we talked about the heart of a leader. And if you remember that, uh, uh, you know, the heart of being a leader. And so we're just going to narrow it down this class. We're going to talk about uh, values and disciplines of a strong leader. Now, uh, the moment we talk about values and disciplines, the first thing that comes to our mind is our life, right? Uh, they say, hey, you know, we, sometimes we say it very nonchalantly. Or just, we just say, hey, get your values right. Or you know, your parents say, hey, be disciplined. Um, and these are values and disciplines are something that uh, is developed, right? So, and it can be changed. So, for example, if somebody is by nature very lazy, uh, it's, a, it's, a dis it's a value or a discipline that can be changed. Right? Uh, the person can become very hardworking in you know if he puts his mind to it. Right? Uh, so always remember, uh, uh, disciplines is something that is developed and can change over time. Uh, again, you can have good disciplines, you can have bad disciplines. So let's look at a few of them. Right? Number one value is a life free from habitual sin. Now we read through the scriptures, uh, you know, all through the New Testament as well. Uh, uh, especially in Paul's episodes, he he talks a lot about sin and, and what sin does to us, right? He says, hey, I'm crucified with Christ. It's, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Um, then he, he goes on in Romans, in chapter 1, 2, and 3, he talks about what sin does and the judgment of God on sin. Uh, chapter 4, he talks about God's righteousness. And he says, okay, we by nature will sin. But we have God's righteousness through the blood of Jesus. We we can stand righteous. We can stand justified. Right. So sin will come knocking. Sin is not. Satan is not going to look at um, how many years of experience we have, or uh, are we a pastor? Are we a apostle? Are we working in the marketplace? It doesn't matter to him. Sin will come knocking, uh, and as believers we need to be able to counter sin uh, and temptations, right? Temptations will come. And, and Jesus did this, you know, he set a beautiful example for us. Uh, we look at scriptures when he was tempted. He just defended all his temptations through the word of God. And, and so right now, you and I have the word of God that we can rely on to overcome habitual sin. Uh, you know, some of us may say, okay, I don't have a habitual sin, but I just have this small thing in my life and uh, it's not a habit. I go once in three months to, you know, maybe with my friends or I go with my office colleagues once in three months. And once in three months, I drink a little bit of alcohol. It's only once in three months. 
Uh, now, here's the thing. The scriptures also say that if you give the enemy a foothold, he will be able, he will, you know, don't give the enemy a foothold lest he take the entire house. Right? So, number one, as leaders, get away from habitual sin. If you know that is something that is tormenting you, or there's something that could treat them as a sin and become habitual, stay away from it. Protect yourself. Cover yourself by the blood of Jesus. Use the word as a weapon. Have you ever thought about this? Ephesians chapter 6. It says, or Paul is writing, he's talking about the armor of God. And every weapon in the armor of God is, is a defense. You've got the shield of faith. Got the, uh, you know, the breastplate of righteousness. You got the helmet of salvation. These are these are defense. But then he says, you also have the sword of the spirit. And a sword is is not only used as a defense; it's also used as an offense. And so you use this word. And and so God has given us the word of God. His word is more than enough. To overcome temptations more than enough. We don't need anything more. All we need to say is, hey, devil, this is what you are, you know, this is what the word of God is saying. And so I will stand on what God says and what whatever temptation you're bringing and nullify it. I use the shield of faith. I quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. That's the, just those two verses will enable us to live free from sin. This is quench every fiery dart of the wicked one brings against us. Right. I have the sword of the spirit. That is the word of God that will that will destroy every temptation. That will nullify the works of the enemy. Right. So if you look at it. We don't have an excuse. I'm not saying that we, you know, temptations won't come. They will come. We don't have an excuse. Right? Because when Jesus was on the cross and he said it is finished, it is finished. He paid the price. He said, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit inside us. And as, as, as believers, as we grow into maturity, all writes to the Corinthians. He says, uh, you know, if we read Corinthians, it's, it's it's a stern book, but it's also a book which uh, Paul is in a very uh, hurt by what's happening. Saying, hey, you guys are all, you know, you're flowing the gifts and you have all these wonderful things happening to you, but uh, but I think I still have to give you milk. This the solid food is not going in, though you are flowing in the gifts of the spirit, but that are behaving like children who drink milk. Um, and so it's very important, even as we grow into levels of leadership, put away things that are childish. It's different between childish and childlike. We have childlike faith, but we don't behave childish. Right? So very, very important. Free from habitual sin. And then there are a lot of practical ways that we can do that. Number one way is just get up morning, whatever time you feel like, have a regular prayer times, have regular times of reading the word of God. Right? Uh, you know, sometimes we may get busy and we say, okay, I'll do that later. No, do this first and then do the other things later. Out of that, you will begin your strength. Time alone with God. And you, you just you just sit and you know you, you receive from him open the word and read his word you know this morning i'm just reading a very simple calming chapter a psalm that we always read and by me saying it you may say hey that's a common psalm i was just reading psalms 91 and this morning and the end portion is so beautiful it says uh and they will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy and show him my salvation. 
I just thought about that. Just those couple of lines. A long life I was satisfied. I was shocked by salvation. That is, the Hebrew there is uh, so and so. I'll show him the things that I can do. I will show him prosperity. I will show him healing and deliverance. I will be with him. Give him that salvation. As part of the word of God can just be really, it, it destroys, it completely disarms the devil. Right? Uh, number two, a fully developed prayer life. As a leader, you you know we talked about this right the heart of a leader you can only give what you have if we don't have it we can't give it if we don't have it and we try to give it it's not going to be of any use it's not going to be effective at all so a fully developed prayer life is very important now you may say you know i'm working monday to friday i'm not in full-time ministry uh, i'm just going and on Saturdays, I lead a life group. It doesn't matter. Monday to Friday, or all seven days of the week, develop a prayer life. Spend time praying. You know, I can say this many a times. I've, you know, I usually wake up early in the mornings. I like to wake up early in the mornings for prayer. And many a times, right? I, I've just woken up. You, you take that first 10 minutes to get your sleep off. Many times, just been overwhelmed by the presence of God. Just, just God. And, and there's no words. It's just being still in His presence. It's not saying anything. Say, like, God, you are, you know, you're, just, you're just lost for words. You don't know what to pray. You, you, you just, that's happened many times. So prayer is not always you talking. It's not always, you know, uh, just, you know, giving out a list. And I'm sure we all know this, right? And God, this, 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 this. Sometimes it's just being in his presence. Being in, you know, especially when you're in the storm. Maybe it's in a storm in your life. Boat has been rocked. Thank God. We have this whole prayer list. Do this, do this, do this, and it's it's, it's natural. It's natural. We want to do. We we do pray for whatever the issue or the problem we see. But many times, I love the book of Exodus, and uh, it's just a it's just the Exodus from Egypt to Israel. It's a whole study for a year because the people they've come to the Red Sea, and what does God tell them? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And still, God tells Joshua, Joshua is going to part the sea, the, the, the river of Jordan. He says, Joshua, tell the high priest, get into the water, right? And stand still. Don't do anything. Just get into the water. Let your feet touch the water. Then the moment you go in, little by little, I will part the seas. Sometimes it's not only about just giving a whole list of, of prayer points, but we hear from him. He just rests in his presence. Now you have, when it comes to prayer, when, why we say a fully developed prayer life is because you want to have time alone with God, right? Then you have it with your spouse and family. And then you have it with your cell members or your church members. Why is this important? Now we cannot say okay i had prayer with my family so that's done no you got to spend time alone with god as well uh so you you balance it out right so you know normally since i wake up early by eight o'clock i want to sleep 8 p.m i'm sleeping and the kids are all running all over the place they are fully active so what do i do what do we do so you know we just get them all together and we have a prayer family get the kids to pray, get them to read a couple of verses, and we get them to sing a couple of songs, make them read a, a few verses and tell them, okay, what do you what do you understand from this verse? They may share a few points, and then we 
hold hands together, pray and close. It may not be as intense as when you are alone with God. But what you're doing is, again, you're being an example to your spouse and to your family. And your children are watching you more than listening to you. So develop a full, fully, a fully developed prayer life. And remember this, when you spend time alone with God, that is that will reflect in public. Your time in private will reflect your ministry in public. Always remember that, right? So develop a good prayer life. Three, uh, the earned respect of cell members. That means a lot of servanthood, meaning just be normal, just be with them, right? Uh, don't feel that you, you know, you've got the upper hand, or we are better than them. Or, you know, just just being normal, right? And that that earns a lot of respect from others, right? Now, then faithful involvement in the local church leadership training. Uh, get involved as a like group leader. You must be involved, right? And they watch you, right? It's not like only being involved in the church on Sundays. Sorry, in the cell groups, but also in the church. Uh, involve your cell groups to attend meetings, conferences, fasting prayers, uh, everything that the church is doing, get them to be involved and you yourself be involved, right? You can't tell um, somebody in your cell group, hey, go for the prayer when, you know, you may have, you, you and I may have certain, you know, uh, maybe a few things that we need to get done. We may not be able to be there for every day for a fasting prayer, but um, they got to see you at least once a while. Say, okay, come, let's go for the prayer. I was there, it was good. Yeah. It's a good time to you know learn and grow. Right? Um, another aspect is to a strong desire to share Christ's love with anyone who will listen. This is something that is very natural for leaders, and um it's natural, it will come. If we have if we don't have it, ask the Lord to give you give you that desire. Lord, help me to share Christ's love with whoever you, you bring me in contact with, right? And, and, and it becomes a natural. It, it's just an overflow, right? Hey, if God has done this for me, God can do it for you, right? Uh, and then uh, uh, determination to help fellow cell members reach their friends to Christ, meaning, you know, you, you help your cell members to reach out to people right uh, encourage them to take a step right now this is important because we talked about this in uh life side evangelism right many a times uh that there, there could be many 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 inhibitions that we may go through and right? sometimes it's fear it's shy uh or what will people think or what if they don't believe or what if you know they don't really have a problem so we may have many inhibitions but uh, uh as a leader we must help people overcome inhibitions uh teach them train them give them opportunities um go with them whenever needed right whenever it's possible go with them uh, and and you know enable them to uh, you know many a times they may feel okay it's not my responsibility uh, I'm, I'm a believer I'm a part of a cell group but it's not my responsibility to go and share or you know, sometimes it's like I may not have that anointing, or maybe God has not called me for that. No, no. God has called all of them. Right? It doesn't matter what uh, you know, uh, gift or grace that God has given us. All of us have been called to minister to people, to evangelize the gospel. Because whether it's coming for a, from a man, from a woman, from a child. The gospel is the gospel. We talked about this, right? It is the power of God. You can have a six-year-old boy or a girl minister to a 60-year-old and, and they share the gospel and that 60-year-old can accept Jesus. Why? Not because of the six-year-old, it's because, of, because what they said is powerful. It is the power of God unto salvation. It's the gospel. So you teach them, let them know. It's not about us. It's not about uh, 
of course we have practical ways of sharing it that's where you come and you teach them but then the whole basis is saying god will do it for us it's god's will right so let's go into the next portion church leadership no when we talk about leadership in the church there is it's a vast subject it's a vast subject right? leadership is something uh you know we also you know briefly talked about it. leadership can come in three ways uh number one leadership can be achieved can achieve and become a leader two leadership comes through uh you know as a successor right, through an inheritance of so your parents are you know leaders in the church sometimes you become the leader or if your parents are ceos in the company next you become the ceo and um, so first one is leadership is 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 you know it, it is achieved Second is leadership is come as uh, through, uh, you know, through an inheritance, and thirdly, leadership is given to people, right? Without any hard work, it's just given, and they grow in it. Right? So these are three primary ways. It's not in your notes, but uh, leadership in the church is very important. Now remember this. Uh, um, uh, especially when you look at a church, it's, it, there's many aspects. Now with the church, uh, with all the things that are happening within church, right? it's no longer, you know, I would say maybe 15, 20, or 20 or 30 years back, um, church was okay. You get a room, you, you know, you start off one guitar, one people, you start off, because it does happen now as well. Uh, but now when you look at church, it's more of ministry and organization. You got the ministry aspect, you got the organizational aspect. Right? So in church leadership, uh, there are many, many, many different aspects that you may learn. Now, God may have called you only for the ministry aspect of leadership. God may have called you only for the organizational aspect of a ministry. Right? Now, for example, Pastor, associate pastor, like group leaders, so the ministry. And then here we've got um, you know, administration, uh, we've got uh, events and services, we've got the media team, IT team, graphics team, we've got different teams. Now that's the organizational aspect. And sometimes God may involved you know god may give us the skills to be involved in both and so let's look at a few principles of church leadership right now this is what peter wagner says a, a pastor who is a possibility thinker and whose dynamic leadership has been used to catalyze the entire church into action for dynamic growth Great leaders will build great churches. It's so powerful, right? Great leaders will build great churches. Now, if if we as leaders are able, good leaders, are able to do things in the right way, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, with godly principles, your foundation is strong. Then we'll end up having great churches on the flip side average leaders will build average churches now remember that average leaders can always become great leaders right that's that's god's design that's what god wants us to be he wants us to be great leaders so this word here average is a choice of what it's our choice god said I will put on you the spirit of excellence. Joseph was not an average leader. Daniel was not an average leader. The apostle Paul was not an average leader. 
Peter was not an average leader, he was an average man. But Peter, when we read, I was reading the book of Acts, it's very, very interesting. Right? Where the same man, Peter, right? He's going up, Peter and John, they go, and 3,000 people believe his message. I mean, have you ever thought of it? You know, sometimes we just say it, right? 3,000 people believe the message. But 3,000 people believed in his first sermon. And what is he doing? He is quoting from Joel. Now, he didn't have the, the Bible does not say that he had those scriptures open there and quoting from Joel. He knew it. It was the Holy Spirit who put it in him. And he said, listen, it's, they're not drunk. It's, it's only you know, 11 in the morning. But this is what the prophet Joel said. And he's quoting the whole scripture. And I was reading it. I was thinking, this fisherman, unschooled, is quoting from Joel, like four or five scriptures, and he's sharing this message with such authority, 3,000 people believe it. And that's not average. That's great. Right? And so all through the scriptures we see that, you know, leaders, great leaders will build great churches. Look at this. Anti-leaders will harm and break down churches, as well as church leaders and their vision for God. I think this is the most disheartening thing that can happen within the body of Christ. But there can be people, pastors, leaders, who can harm, break down churches, who can break down church leaders, who can speak you know, even the world wouldn't speak about them in that way. And there are you know, ministers of God who can criticize and bring so much of hate to other church leaders. But this is uh, this is something that is not this is not right. right. Now it's not like everyone is perfect. Remember Moses when when his sister and his wife said, you know. Moses did this, Moses did that. They accused Moses. What did God tell Moses? That was, uh, you know, they were, they were struck with leprosy and God, God told Moses, God, and, you know, God told them, how can you speak about my servant Moses? Because I talked to him face to face. All the others I talked with riddles and, uh, you know, dreams and visions, but not so with Moses, I talked to him face to face. Now, as believers, as leaders, we must be very careful on who we speak about and what we speak about. The best thing is don't speak about anyone. Just do what God has called you to do. Focus on what, focus on your track. You are running a race. Maybe there are some people overtaking you. You don't look at them and be discouraged. But you focus on your track. This is the track that God has laid out for me. So I'm going to go on this track. Okay. Wise leaders know that they must utilize all available leadership to the maximum. Therefore, concentrate on equipping and mobilizing them to function as function effectively. So as leaders, we must know how to utilize all available leadership. And this is something that we see all through the scriptures. Right? We see Moses did that. We see Joshua. We see David. David was powerful in terms of building leaderships and building teams. He did it so successfully. Uh, and he was only 30, 32, I guess, 32 or 33 when he became the king. Right? And he was able to do it. He raised up leaders. Right? He raised up the strongest army that could have ever reigned was led by David, right? He mobilized his people. He knew how to equip them. He knew how to uh, focus on both the ministry and the, you know, the army part of, 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 uh, uh, of Israel, right? So mobilize, maximize your strength, right? Maximize your potential maximize the potential of your other leaders. Success in ministry 
is based on the available ability to raise up successors. Therefore, success without raising successors is a failure. I hope you got that sentence, right? Success in ministry is based on the ability to raise up successors. I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, how many of you have heard of uh, William J. Uh, uh I think you would have learned that in revivals, visitations of moves of God. Um, the Azusa Street Revival, powerful ministry, powerful anointing. God just used him so powerfully by that street, that small street, Azusa Street, at the corner of that place. It, it, it was, it, firstly, he was a black, and black was, you know, they were, during those days, uh, you know, the black were, were not allowed to even mingle with the whites, and they were they were downcast. They were looked down upon. But when he started the ministry, the ministry started growing. God just supernaturally this multiplied this ministry. There were healings, miracles. People were waiting at five a.m. with umbrellas to get into the church. But then what happened? He, William they say more just one thing. He missed to raise up successes. And when we look at the ministry, at one point, because of all the other things that happened between, it ended up with around, I, I don't get the exact number, but somewhere around 300 odd people in the church. Why? Because he could not maximize potential. What could have he done better? I believe if William J. Seymour had raised, you know, maybe about 200 to 300 leaders, right? uh, maybe cell groups, or just, just, you know, raising up leaders, I believe the ministry will grow. It would have grown. Um, and just, it, it was single-handed, uh, a, a powerful ministry, but it was single-handed. The moment he had to go out, he was on a break. The entire ministry came from crumbling down because there's nobody else who could take it up, right? So success in ministry is the ability to raise up successors. Moses raised Joshua, Paul raised Timothy. He must be able to raise others, right? Great leaders understand how to get everyone to participate, especially when it comes to a cell group or a church, get people to participate. Now, for example, right, you, your, your church is small, you have about 100 people in your church. Get people to participate. How are you going to do that? Right? You, you get a feel of the people. That's where your inbuilt leadership qualities come alive, right? Say, okay. You're talking to somebody, the Holy Spirit may say, hey, hey, why don't you give this person a chance to live the prayer? And so, you know, you, you share with them, okay, can we do this? Uh, this is something that we, we can plan. Do you think you want to uh, you know, spend time in prayer? Uh, you know, lead the church in prayer, 8 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. Or, or why don't you give this person an opportunity to do the declaration? Uh, or this person can lead a team because... I remember this happened at the church where um, this was young, not young couple, but this couple was attending our church. And I got to know that they are they're, they're like senior managers. They are high level, um, you know, managers in their organization. Right? Uh, but what I noticed was they were coming every Sunday, attending church and going right? because they would meet with people and all of that. And they're good. I thought to myself, they are, you know, in the workplace, they are leading teams of 200, 300 people. So they have the potential. Their potential is not to come sit at church and go back. So I, I, I just knew that I had to give them something. Just, but I didn't know what to do. So uh, I said, how, how do I? Because we already had teams in place. Um, and so I remember we uh, we just came up with something where we uh, you know there was greet meet and greet team. And so they would 
they have to meet and greet team would just come, they welcome everyone. And after the church, they would go and talk to the first time visitors. And they would make them feel comfortable. So I said, okay, can you lead this team? So first of all, there was no team. So we made that team. Uh, and they were very happy. So, yeah, sure, we can do it. Uh, they were very confident, could speak. They, they are used to building teams. And, and then I said, you know, why don't you, you know, just build a team so that when you're not there, you know, somebody else can take your place. So they immediately started building a team. They made a roster, and uh, you know, they would uh, they would be there at 7:30 a.m. at church. And everything. I just knew that you know that's 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 a that's a gift that they have, and they can use it in the church, right? So we we must develop this ability to get everyone to participate, see their skills, their talents, right? And now it could be in any team. Right? There were many folks who we encouraged them to get into the sound and setup team. They were interested in it. Get them in, and get them to participate, right? Along with the pastor, the rest of the leadership must be totally committed to the church growth. Right now, when we see church growth, right, somewhere sometimes the understanding is about church growth is only numbers. It is not numbers. Right? Uh, when you talk about church growth, it is who's the church? We are the church. So church growth is us growing from a place of, you know immaturity or from a place of being babes in Christ to growing into leadership. Right. So we need to get this out of our mind that you know it's all about church uh, about you know numbers. It's not now of course the Bible also says in the book of Acts that uh, the Lord added numbers to the church. Right. Uh, so the Lord will add right the Lord will add people the Lord will add families and people into the church, but the responsibility of a pastor and the rest of the leadership is to develop people. Remember, we talked about this. Ministry is about people. So even if you have 100 people, develop those 100 people. What you're doing is church growth. When you say, hey, 10 years, I'm still on 100 people. That's okay. Of course, we're praying for church growth. That's important. It's an aspect of church growth, but it's also about taking a person, growing people into the things of God. That is the greatest uh, you know, comfort or strength that we can find as leaders. But a leader's effectiveness is greatly influenced by those closest to him. That is his leadership team. When people follow a leader because they want to, he is on he or she is on the way to great achievement. Look at that. When people follow a leader because they want to, not because they have to, because they want to. I remember this. Every one of us will one day have to move on. Right? But the ministry will have to continue. The work of God will have to continue. So how do we do this? Always remember that the ministry, you know, you and I may be the pioneers of a ministry. But always remember that you're building God's kingdom. God has used you to build his kingdom. So it is not yours, nor is it mine. Of course, we make decisions, we plan, we do things, and God has given you that responsibility, but there'll come a time that responsibility will be taken and given to somebody else, to the succeeding generation. Now, if I need, if you and I need a good leader in the succeeding generation, we must deposit the word of God, the things of God, into their life. Right? And we must do that. Intentionally, we must do that. Right, and you know, God can choose some of the most. Uh, you know, we may have ten people in our mind, but God can choose people who, you know, who we may feel is not good enough. Perfect example is David. 
Why would God choose the shepherd? You know, have you ever thought of this? You've got seven of them who are already in the army. They already know they have the skills. They are big and strong. Already. You don't need to train them. But that's not what God wanted. God said, I need somebody who doesn't know anything. Who's won victories in silence. Who has who's much braver than these seven boys. They look strong on the outside, but when a Goliath comes, they are weak. But I know David. I've seen him kill a lion. Nobody's seen him. I've seen him kill a bear. I know that he's brave. All he needs is a little bit of help. So you anoint him. I will help him become the leader. You see how God thinks? He doesn't work according to our plan. He doesn't work according to our time schedules. So you must understand. Uh, and, and so our responsibility is to speak into people's lives, deposit into them, like, uh, that they would and, you know, in turn become great leaders. So how do we train cell members into cell leaders? Let's look at a few steps. I know we have a few minutes left. Let's look at a few. Yeah. Step one, develop relationships with members. Now, remember we talked about this? Uh, you know, ministry is about people, right? So you do develop relationships. I cannot speak into a person's life if I've not developed a relationship with them. Right? So this developing relationship can take months, can take years. Now, how do we know that? See, for example, I remember this at our church location, uh, some in August, we restarted after COVID, August 22. And uh, during that time, this young couple came in, uh, I think somewhere in September. This young couple came, just newly married. They've come from another city. They've come here, they've got a job. And just probably a couple of months in Bangalore. So they came up to me. I remember meeting them. They said, you know, they just married. Uh, and they're looking for a house as well. And uh, we helped them get a house. Uh, some of our church folks, but something clicked. I remember, right? Uh, and so we, 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 the first time we spoke to them, we, I felt that I knew them for years. It's this feeling. I, mean, I knew them for years. It was like, okay. It was so, it was such a connect. And, and then they came next Sunday. They said, see, still, you know, we are, We've been serving in the church in our city. So we cannot come sit and go. That's not possible for us. We have to do something. So he gave us something to do. Right? Uh, and they just, the second week of their coming, they don't know anybody in church. Second week, they started serving in the church. And they started, you know, uh, of course, it was just, you know, uh, sound and set up and welcoming people. Uh, but they developed such a, relationship with the church members that you know yeah you know, they had to move houses so right now they are about you know 25 or 30 kilometers away they come every sunday 30 kilometers driving they're there at 6 45 in church because you know, well, you know the husband is in some set up and the wife is at ushering so sometimes these kind of things happen, and it's beautiful to watch. But sometimes uh, you gotta get people. You gotta hold them and say, "Hey, why don't you start serving? Why don't you, uh, you know, uh, think of becoming a leader?" Uh, but even as you do that, right, do it in love. Look for those who have heart, the heart for God. Uh, you know, spend time with them. Uh, the things that they enjoy to no, especially if it's cell group, right? Um, just, just, just be friendly, right? Just uh, enjoy with them. Um, you know, Jesus' disciples were his best friends. I'm sure they were, because you know, Jesus didn't have any other friends apart from disciples. But, but he never, he never let go of them, right? He was always with them. And we learn a lot when we're able to spend time together. Relationship is the foundation stone to obtaining the best out of people. You have to win their hearts before you can make their hands. What a powerful word. You know, 
of sentences. So you have to win their hearts before you win their hearts. You speak into their heart. You speak into their lives. And then they will do the rest. They will do the work. They will be willing to serve with all their heart in the church. If you, you speak into their life, with their hearts. Build a relationship with them. Right? And over time, you will be available. They will, you know, even if you ask them, they will be ready and willing to do things. Sometimes you don't even have, you don't even have to ask them because they, they just know that you know they have to uh, do something for the church. Step one: get them to become leaders. So somebody had some question. Somebody raise their hand. Sorry, uh, as I'm presenting the notes, I can't even speak. Yes, yeah, that, yeah I, ju I just posted a question. You can oh, sorry. feel free to answer whenever you're... Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. The way I'll answer it now. How can one understand if and when God has called them to be a leader? Okay. Um, so, the one of the ways is, see, one is the call of God. Like for example, um, you know, you know that you want to be a pastor. Example, right? I'm just taking it in the in the ministry side. Like I'm not talking about the corporate. So you know that God has called you to be a pastor. You want to teach. You want to preach, and all of that. So that's one. Um, secondly, you will notice that God is opening doors for you, and these may be doors that. You didn't really pray for, right? And suddenly this door is open. So you step into those doors. Now remember that uh, becoming a leader is a journey, right? Now sometimes leadership may just come to you, right, as we talked about it. But sometimes leadership, God takes you through stages, and you start small, then you go up, you go up. Uh, so how can you understand? Number one. Understand that God wants us all to be doing something for Him, right? Something for His for His kingdom. Uh, and as you keep doing it faithfully, God will begin to open doors. And there are doors that He will also shut. Right? And, 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 and when He opens a door, you step into it faithfully. And then you, you know, you you just step in, you ask God to lead you. Uh, now, if you feel, for, so for example, the way you feel that, okay, now God has called me only to be a member of the cell group, to serve. Uh, now, it's very unlikely that God will want you to be in the same place for you know, 10, 15 years. Because scriptures say, it's not God's design. Right? Scriptures say that he will build you up line upon line, precept upon precept. Right? So it is by nature, that God's nature is to raise up people into being better and you know getting them into leadership roles. Right? So I will say that we are. Let, let me share this example. I never thought I'll be a pastor. I've shared it always. I always thought I'll be a worship leader. I always knew that. But all of a sudden, I remember, I think it was 2000. Well, so you're going to preach in this place in one of our locations. So how can I preach? I mean, I, I used to go lead worship in all these locations. But preach. Oh, and I thought, God, oh, preaching is something very different. Uh, I said, okay. I was a little weary, but then I said, okay. I had no choice. I had to do it because I was already put in. My name was already put in. So I went. And then I had a lot of questions. God, what am I? Am I a worship leader? Am I a Master, what am I? Right. But as I, as I just step into the door that is open, God begins to, uh, you know, open many more doors, and we realize it doesn't matter whether we are worship leader, pastor, apostle, all of that. Different. What matters is, as as you know, as a leader, you are you're able to do what God's called you to do, and also to minister to others. Right. And our goal is to raise up other people. So. So sometimes we just got to step into the doors, open doors in faith, and allow God to work. Sure.
Sure, sure, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, we will meet next class and we'll continue from step two. God bless.